IP or intellectual properties are, do you feel that they're an integral component to personal freedoms or a detriment? And what place does intellectual property have in uh, public and academic settings? That's a very interesting question, and it has an interesting history. Uh, the uh, World Trade Organization, the Uruguay Round that set up the World Trade Organization, uh, imposed, uh, it's, it's called a free trade agreement. It's, in fact, a highly protectionist agreement. Uh, the U.S. is strongly opposed to free trade, just as business leaders are, just as they're opposed to a market economy. Uh, a crucial part of the Uruguay Round, the World Trade Organization, NAFTA, and the rest of them, is a very strong, uh, what are called intellectual property rights. What it actually means is rights that guarantee monopoly pricing power to private tyrannies. So if you take, say, a drug corporation, uh, most of their profit, uh, the, the most of the serious research and development, the hard part of it, is funded by the public. In fact, most of the economy comes out of public expenditures through the state system, which is the source of most innovation and development. I mean, computers, the Internet, uh, you know, just go through the range. It's all coming out of the state system primarily. There is research and development in the corporate system, some, but it's mostly at the marketing end. Uh, and the same is true of drugs. Uh, but once the corporations are gain the benefit of the public paying the costs and taking the risks, they want to monopolize the profit. And uh, the intellectual property rights, uh, they're not for small inventors. In fact, you know, the people in doing the work and the corporations, they don't get anything out of it, uh, you know, a dollar if they invented something. But uh, it's the corporate tyrannies that are making the profits, and they want to guarantee them. Uh, the World Trade Organization uh, proposed new enhanced intellectual property rights, patent rights, which means monopoly pricing rights, uh, far beyond anything that existed in the past. In fact, they are not only designed to maximize monopoly pricing and profit, but also to prevent development. It's rather crucial. World Trade Organization rules introduced product patents. It used to be you could patent a process, but not the product, which means if some smart guy could figure out a better way of doing it, he, he could do it. They want to block that. It's important to block development and progress in order to ensure monopoly rights and enough product patents. Well, if you take a look at, say, take U.S. history, okay? Suppose the colonies, after independence, had been forced to accept that regime. Uh, you know what we'd be doing now? Uh, first of all, there'd be very few of us here. But those of us who would be here would be pursuing our comparative advantage in uh, exporting uh, fish and fur. Uh, you know, that's what economists tell you is right. Pursue your comparative advantage. That was our comparative advantage. We certainly wouldn't have had a textile industry. Um, British textiles were way cheaper and better. Actually, British textiles were cheaper and better because Britain had crushed Irish and Indian superior textile manufacturers and stolen their techniques. So they were now the preeminent textile manufacturer by force, of course. Uh, the U.S. would never have had a textile industry. I mean, it grew up around Massachusetts, but the only way it could develop was by extremely high tariffs, uh, which protected unviable uh, U.S. industries. So the textile industry developed, and that has a spin-off into other industries, and so it continues. I mean, the U.S. would never have had a steel industry. Again, same reason. Uh, British steel was way superior. Uh, one of the reasons is because they were stealing Indian techniques. Uh, in British engineers were going to India to learn about steel making well into the 19th century. Uh, but Britain you know, ran the country by force so they could take what they knew and they developed a steel industry. And the U.S. imposed extremely high tariffs, also massive government involvement, you know, through the military system as usual, and the U.S. developed the steel industry. And so it continues right up to the present. Furthermore, that's true of every single developed society. You take a look at That's one of the best-known truths of economic history, is that the only countries that developed are the ones that pursued these techniques, uh, the ones that weren't. A, the, there were countries that were forced to adopt free trade, liberalization, the colonies, and they got destroyed, you know. I mean, the divide between the first and the third world is really since the 18th century. It wasn't very much in the 18th century. And it's very sharply along these lines. Well, you know, that's what the intellectual property rights are for. 
In fact, there's a name for it, but in economic history, this developed Friedrich List, the famous German political economist in the 19th century, who was actually borrowing from Andrew Hamilton, uh, called it kicking away the ladder. First, you use state power and violence to develop, then you kick away those procedures so that other people can't do it. Uh, that's uh, Intellectual property rights has very little to do with uh, individual initiative. I mean, like Einstein didn't have any intellectual property rights on relativity theory. Uh, science and uh, you know, innovation is carried out by people who are interested in it. Um, that's the way science works. You know. I mean, there's an effort in very recent years to commercialize it, like to commercialize everything else. So you don't do it because it's exciting and challenging. You want to find out something new and you want the world to benefit from it. You do it because maybe you can make some money out of it. I mean, that's, uh, you know, well, you can make your own judgment about the moral value. I think it's extremely cheapening, but also destructive of initiative and development. And the, 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 the profits don't go back to individual inventors. I mean, they're this very well-studied topic. I mean, take, say, one that's really well studied and that MIT is involved in, uh, 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 computer-controlled machine tools, very fundamental component of the economy. Well, there's a very good study of this by David Noble, a uh, leading political economist. What he pointed out, what he discovered is that uh, the techniques were invented by some small guy, you know, manufacturing guy working in his garage somewhere in, I think, Michigan. Uh, and when the, when, actually when the MIT and mechanical engineering department learned about it, they picked them up and they developed them and ex extended them and so on, and big corporations came in and picked them up from them, and finally it became a core part of U.S. industry. Well, what happened to the guy who invented it? He's still probably working in his garage in Michigan or wherever it is, and that's very typical. Uh, I, I just don't think it has much to do with uh, innovation or independence. It has to do with protecting major concentrations of power, which mostly got their power as a public gift, and making sure that they can uh, maintain and expand their power. I, I don't, and these highly protectionist devices, I don't think, you really have to ram them down through people's throats. They don't make any economic sense or any other sense. So uh, what role, though, do you think that they should play in an academic public institution? Well, I don't think they should play any role. But uh, the, uh, I mean, since, the, uh, since 1981, there was, a, there was a, an amendment by amendment which gave universities the right to uh, pat patent uh, uh, inventions that came out of their own research. Actually, that's a kind of a gag. I mean, nothing comes out of the university's own research. It comes out of public funding. That's how the university can function. That's how their research projects work. Uh, the whole thing is set up to socialize cost and risk to the general public. And then within that context, yeah, in your biology lab, you invent something. But I don't think universities should patent it. They should be working for the public good. And that means it should be available to the public. Thank you.